I want to acknowledge that Royal Rose University is on the lands of Esquimalt and the Sanhis ancestors and families. With gratitude, we live, work, and learn here. What a gift we all come together and share this space. I'm going to introduce next speaker, Sarah, Sarah Dale, Professor Northern Medical Program, Canada Research Chair in Humanities and Health Equities. University of Northern British Columbia. She is an award-winning researcher and a creative writer whose work focuses broadly on marginalized peoples and geographies. She grew up and has spent most of her time in Northern British Columbia, including Haida Gwaii and the Terrace. She is the research director of the Health Arts Research Center and teaches in the areas of indigenous people's well-being and health humanities. To welcome Sarah, I'm so thrilled. I'm going to read a short poem from her. Why is breaking bias and value differences so important in 2022? It's still relevant this year because there is no time like the present because it's always the right time to celebrate diversity and equity because biases should be critically placed in their time and place, which are likely outdated and harmful because now is always a good time to strive for something better because the present is a time that's not good enough for far too many. Because it's time to stop putting off to some imaginative future because we can all make a little time. Because sometimes all it takes is time because we can all make time. And it's time to make a difference, please. Welcome, Sarah Dale. Jesse, thank you so much. You've just kind of made me weepy. I'd forgotten that I wrote that poem, um, I think last year for International Women's Day for UBC's Faculty of Medicine. I was asked why now is a good time to focus on questions about equity, diversity, and inclusion in UBC's Faculty of Medicine. Um, so I wrote that poem and I forgot that it's uh, published in the World Wide Web machine. Um, so Jesse, thank you so much for that opening. Jesse, are you able to share my slides and can you hear me? I just want to make sure that um, I'm not uh, out in the world not being able to hear anything. And can, can you make it just so that we're on the cover slide, slide one? Oh, thanks Val very much for telling me you can hear me. I appreciate it. And Val, uh, I noticed your um, uh, lovely uh, gesture about Paris not being in Northern VC. And I have to tell you years ago when I was doing my um, undergraduate degree at UVic in creative writing, I met somebody um, who had never been north of Hope, and they asked me where I was from, uh, and I said, Terrace, and they said, you're from Paris? That's amazing, I've never met anybody from Paris, and I said, no, no, I'm from Terrace, and they said, I've, I've never heard of Terrace, so um, are you from Paris? And I was like, no, I'm from Paris in Northern BC. So uh, yes, Val, I am not from Paris. I'm from Paris. And uh, frankly, I'm sort of glad I'm from Paris as opposed to Paris. So Jesse, thank you very, very much for that kind reading of a poem. And Val, amazing. Uh, I'm planning on spending some quality time with pharmacists up in Fort St. John in the not too distant future. Okay, uh, Jesse, do you want to uh, go to the next slide and I'll start this presentation for you all? Hopefully it'll take about uh, 40 minutes of reading, half an hour, 40 minutes of reading, and then we can have about an hour for, or an hour, about 15 minutes for um, conversation and questions. 
This is a photograph that I took just the other night uh, when I was out on a trail run and hike with my dog, who you'll meet at the very end of this presentation. So um, as I've just said, Jesse, thanks so much for the kind introduction. And I wanna thank the organizers of this conference. And I really want to also acknowledge how humbled I am to be amongst the incredible and amazing lineup of presenters assembled for this conference. Huzzah, Royal Roads. I think you've done a great job bringing uh, incredible folks together. I also want to begin with an acknowledgement of my current place on lands violently occupied by settlers. So my feet right now uh, in my office are planted on a carpet in an office building situated on lands that have been listened to and spoken into being through the insulchion speaking people for longer than these lands have been spoken about or governed in the now dominating language of English. I'm presenting to you today from Silk's Okanagan territory. I divide my time between those territories and the territories of the Tlaitle Tene, lands that have been spoken into being and governed by Dakelf people for longer than they've been uttered about in the now dominant Euro colonial language of English. I want to recognize that these settler stolen lands and occupied areas that I call home are not cleanly or uniformly described in an either or dichotomy of English languages or Indigenous language. And in this light, I also want to re uh, realize and recognize that February is Black History Month, which is something that I hope this paper will uh, unearth and, and comment upon, as you, as you see by the end of the, of the presentation. Colonial violence, I'm sure as many of you know, is a messy and complicated affair. Just up from my house in Okanagan Centre here on Silk's territory runs Camp Road so named because of the Japanese labor camps built on it in the 1930s and 40s, mostly to house Japanese Canadian men who were often shortly thereafter, and along with their entire families, dispossessed and dislocated through internment processes. This is my way of saying and recognizing that white supremacist colonial violence has formed and continues to form every filament of what is now too widely known as British Columbia or Canada. Next slide, Jesse. I'm a woman of Dutch, Irish, and Scottish descent. My opa and oma arrived in so-called Canada from the Netherlands with my father when he was about 14, shortly after the end of World War II and Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. I was in grade three when we moved from Duncan on so-called Vancouver Island to Haida Gwaii, where I lived until we moved from Haida territory to Simpsian Kitsum Kalem territory when I was going into grade 10. I've spent most of my adult life pondering the geographies where I grew up, where I now live, work, play, love, mourn, and where one day I will more than likely be buried. I'm a writer, and I write about the lands and geographies and places where I grew up. I believe acts of writing, of communicating, as per this conference's theme, especially in writing, are inherently political. And I believe poetry and poetics are one means of critically thinking through what it means to occupy and to love and to call home these stolen lands that are so steeped in white Euro-colonial supremacist violence. If you can move us to the next slide, Jesse. With this in mind, let me turn to poet Joy Harjo, the United States' first Native American poet laureate. Harjo is a member of the Muscogee Creek Nation, and her poem Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings offers, I think, one of the most profound insights into thinking and being in relationship to land and to language, and how to communicate about profoundly complicated and messy issues like colonial violence. Here I quote from Joy Harjo's first stanza. Recognize whose lands there are on which we stand. Ask the deer, turtle, and the crane. Make sure the spirits of these lands are respected and treated with goodwill. The land is a being who remembers everything. You will have to answer to your children and their children and theirs. The red shimmer of remembering will compel you up the night to walk the perimeter of truth for understanding. As I brushed my hair over the hotel sink to get ready, I heard, 
by listening, we will understand who we are in this holy realm of words. Do not parade pleased with yourself. You must speak in the language of justice. So let me reiterate those last two lines. Do not parade pleased with yourself. You must speak in the language of justice. These are words, I think, to orient all our communication efforts around. And to this end, my most recent book of poetry took seriously that call to speak in a language of justice. To that end, from start to finish, Lot makes effort to think through unsettling language, to use language in ways that reorient understandings about Haida Gwaii, and to shed lights on ways language produces forms and shapes both understandings of place and ways that places are governed and occupied. Next slide, please, Jesse. I'll here begin reading from Lot. Early on, I learn the world began here, begins here. In the beginning, this land was nothing but sea water, so they say. In the beginning, it was both light and dark, so they say. Contagion monsters are always in visible or sporting beautiful masks. There are many names for land is only one. There are many names for water is only one. There are many names for light is only one. There are many names for raven is only one. For ocean is only one. For bear is only one. For moss is only one. For berry is only one. For salal is only one. For deer is only one. For salmon is only one. For river is only one. There are many names for stone is only one. There are many names for island is only one. There are many names for queen is only one. There are many names for song is only one. There are many names for home is only one. Form a line from first word to last. Form a line from right to wrong. Form a line from left to right. Form a line from start to end, from dark to light, from damp to dry. Form a line from one to none, from grace to terror, from wing to tip, from fish to seal, from A to Z, from water to stone, from east to west, from south to north, from largest to smallest, form a line from youngest to oldest, from sky to ground, from root to crown, form a line from night to horizon, from song to moss, form a line from bullet to skin, form a line from ship to fingertip, form a line from end to start. Beginning word, see water word, say nothing but word word, land word, ground word, rain word, light word, dark word, word they say, world word. We are on water, we land, we are on land my mother, my sister. I step off the queen of the north, there, here, July 1980, another ship, always we are arriving by ship. A world inside a world, inside a world, a word. Inside a world, 
inside a word world. Next slide, please, Jesse. Afro-Caribbean Canadian American poet and essayist M. Nurabiz Philip begins the final essay in her book Zong, which is a breathtaking, breath-shattering work about the mass murder of 133 enslaved African slaves by the crew of the Dutch slave ship Zong in 1781 with the following statement. She says, there is no telling this story. The no tellingness of a story is a sentiment echoed by Black feminist cultural geographer Catherine McKittrick, who in 2015, before turning to a discussion about Philip's poetry, stresses that we ask not how we describe and get over awfulness and brutality, but rather how we live with our world differently right now, and how can we engender new critical interventions. I'll read you that quote again. We should not ask how can we describe and then get over awfulness and brutality, but rather how can we live within our world differently right now and engage new critical interventions. This, I think, is at the heart of all questions about communications in so-called Canada and across Turtle Island in the 21st century. How do we live with our world differently right now and engender new critical interventions? What poet M. Nurabiz Philip writes is something that implicates all of us who work with language as a tool. Her words have resonance in this particular time, this time of calls to actions by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, this time of deeper knowing about murders in residential schools, this time of clear evidence about racism that permeates almost every corner of Canada's healthcare systems and myriad other disciplining systems and systems of power, this time of the United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous people. These times that demand new ways of telling and of understanding the story of colonial violence in this country. Phillips writes, I deeply distrust this tool I work with, language. I distrust its order, which hides disorder. It's logic hiding illogic and its rationality, which is simultaneously irrational. However, if language is to do what it must do, which is communicate these qualities of order, logic, rationality, the rules of grammar must be present. Exceptions to these requirements exist in puns, parables, and of course, in poetry. In these poets and parables, humans push against the boundaries of language by engaging in language that is often neither rational, logical, predictable, or ordered. It is sometimes even non-comprehensible. Poetry thus comes the closest to this latter type of communication, pushing against the boundaries of language. So the imperative for M. Nurabiz Philip as a poet was to move beyond representation, which would have meant ordering an experience which was disordered and which can never nor should ever be ordered. An experience which was irrational, illogical and unpredictable. It would have meant doing a second violence, this time to the memory of an already violent experience. What M. Nurabiz Philip is pointing out is that if we attempt to make ordered or make sense of the colonial violence that has marked the lands in which we all live, we are at risk of doing a second violence to the initial violence of white supremacist Euro-colonial colonization in lands now known as Canada. I think 
It is both the potential of poetry to speak in a language of justice and to refuse the Anglo hegemonic coloniality in the form of standard fare communication that is possibly the most rupturous and liberatory revolutionary potential of poetry that poetry can disrupt. It can refuse order and linearity. It can push against the boundaries of language, the very language that is the tool upon which colonial governance and violence has always rested, those ordered languages of English Euro hegemonic communication. Would you just like to move to the next slide, Jesse, for me? Before I offer two closing readings from Lot, I want to speak briefly about other ways that in Lot, I worked to speak a language of justice to unsettle taken for granted colonial communications and worded Anglo productions of space and place. Here I'll tell you a little bit of a story about how Lot came to be. Lot was inspired by a 2013 conversation I had in Prince George with poet and cultural critic C.S. Giskim, author of In and Out of Dislocation. Cecil asked me about my quirky tendencies to speak about growing up on Haida Gwaii or the Queen Charlotte Islands. Why? asked Cecil, who's a prof out of the University of Berkeley in California, did I vacillate between Haida Gwaii and the Queen Charlotte Islands? I explained that when I grew up in the tiny archipelagos of the Northwest Coast in the late 70s and through the 80s, I only knew the places of my childhood as the Queen Charlotte Islands. Remember, I'm the daughter of a Dutch father who came from the Netherlands. I'm not Haida. I didn't understand those islands that I was growing up on as anything but the Anglo description that I that circulated everywhere that I was. Now, however, I said to Cecil, as somebody who worked in areas of settler colonial geographies, I was committed about and speaking to Haida Gwaii to using the nomenclature of the first peoples of those territories. Oh, said my friend Cecil. And what, he asked me, did I know about Queen Charlotte? I have to say I confessed utter naivety. I, I don't know, I said to Cecil. Is she some wizened British monarch or mm, British queen? I, I, I don't know anything about Queen Charlotte, I said to Cecil. Cecil, who is a scholar who studies the ways that blackness is erased by white coloniality, told me that there's every historical evidence that Queen Charlotte was the first, and up until Meghan Markle, only black British monarch. This shook my sense of colonial violence to the core. I had no idea how I had simply whitewashed and overlooked somebody whose colonial name was already imposed on Haida territory and Haida linguistic descriptors of place. This sort of white supremacist understanding of place was something that I felt needed to be written about and explored and put into the world poetically as a means of unsettling dichotomous divisions between Indigenous and white European settler coloniality. I took Cecil's nudge and I began to write a lot. So before I move into this next reading from Lot, um, I do want to warn you that there are some disquieting pieces of language that you're about to hear. Um, they do reflect the historic record. They are accurate in terms of um, the archival documents that I borrowed from and adapted for the Book of Poetry lot. And they reflect, I think, all of the racist hegemonic underpinnings of so-called British Columbia and certainly of Haida Gwaii. 
Can you flip to the next slide, Jesse? In 1776, Captain Cook landed. He was unable to define an island. He did not claim the country for the British crown, nor did he name it. In 1787, Captain Dixon took possession in the name of King George and called it Queen Charlotte Islands. There they lie, waste fallow, and yet marvelously productive. The natives took an interest proving their capacity for civilization, especially telegraphy filled them with astonishment. They held up their hands. Powerful is the white man, wise and powerful. They need to be continuously guided, watched, and controlled. The heavens were lit up with streaming splendor, the sun began to sink to the westward, a curved line running along the far east from north to south. The sun began to sink. Fit barriers to mark an empire. Some suspect Queen Charlotte wife of King George III, who bore the king 15 children, was of African descent. Valdez heard stories from his Jamaican nanny. Sir Walter Scott wrote of Queen Charlotte that she was ill-colored, her nose too wide, lips too thick. To Baron Christian Frederick Stockmar, Queen Charlotte was small and crooked, with a true mulatto face. She was 17 and a German princess when she married George. He met Charlotte for the first time on their wedding day, September 8th, 1761. She threw herself at his feet. He raised her up. They embraced. She died in 1818. In 2017, a Buckingham Palace spokesperson did not deny Queen Charlotte's African ancestry, stating instead, it's a matter of history, and frankly, we've got far more important things to talk about. We have far more important things to talk about. We have far more important things to talk about. If there's one thing I hope you might leave this talk with, it's the sense that there may be no single thing more important to talk about than colonial violence. It shapes most every way that each geography we occupy is communicated about, and it needs to be unsettled. And to unsettle requires acknowledgement not to again, now again, to return to Joy Harjo without parading, pleased with ourselves. We cannot say there are more important things to talk about. This is parading, pleased with ourselves. We need to give effort to think about how to speak in different and new languages of justice. And with that in mind, I'm going to close with a final reading from Lot, after which, with plenty of time to spare, I think I'd be delighted to enter into a conversation with you and to answer any questions you might have. Lots of people ask me about being a poet in a faculty of medicine and being a poet who is a Canada research chair studying health inequities. So I'd be pleased to enter into those kinds of conversations. Next slide. Please. My sister is a sleepwalker. Also, she is terrified of tsunamis. For two years, she calls out before bed, Mom, Dad, where will we all go after we have washed away? 
We imagine disaster hoping for kindness. We look for that kindness. We imagine disaster. We arrive at the earth, quake, split, and see sea, spit, froth, and balance, rock, mush, bull, frogs, and fog with starfish. In tiny pools that are not tributaries, we wait. We wade, wishing, imagining disaster. We also fish. Fins are what we carve, crave, imagining disaster, the tsunamis that will deliver docks and mounds, moles from ocean under an unknowable global warming. We wait, fishing lines cast tideward the pull of abdomens, sea abalones, sea salal green, our nets bobbing, looking for kindness in bears or wasps, egg pollination. We wait, shark skin, imagine disaster. We awake cranky grumble but are kindred with yew trees and yews that are not trees the laurel and the gorse and heather and alder are all kindness to us yet we imagined disaster walking in sand agate sunshine shipwrecked cloud trout and also newts who try to speak a raven's beak we hope for kindness. Seaweed television, how walrus and sea lions have begun to Skype. The world is there. Whales are there. Yelling is there. The yip of blue of orange and white and brown. We are a stream, a steam and the banks of gulls, something sticky, tricky. We imagine disaster. We count and we learn, still quaking warmth, millimeter by millimeter, the stub of a log, spiky snot, nag, sloud, luff, a quirky eagle, leaf, needle. We also hold onto mushrooms in moss, hoping for kindness rooted in coho scales and spring salmon to marching toward the mainland now. Gray orchids are pillows clutched because we did learn kindness and now we imagine disaster. We are layered chubby beetles, war torn hemlock berries and long houses abscessed with our toothy dismissal. Even whittled cedar is canoe, hate slip shod sideways smacking down satellites and maps. We imagine ourselves terrified white seaweed weed a shell with no mollusks such ships moon floating tugging we mistook kindness imagining disaster we search for fresh water long lists ling cod willow songbird of chainsaws of seals the layers of blubber something like butter like pirates, we trade beads, copper plugs, a volcano, beach, a dragonfly walking leashed by a caddish fly ripple. The dogs join us too. Our stuff, stuffed, trunked, tacked, dry barrels, wood, sugar, and the flowering menziza. These are just the beginning of our catalogs. Barnacles, black cottonwood with rifle debris, insect landing, and we want to sing with no strings and clapping drums, voices lift, but also voices lie down. With our hearts, we craft jetliners gently, gentle now, and stream with engines, tea, and we say kindness. We say kindness again. We say kindness, but we imagine disaster. We knowingly loved hoping for that kindness on Twitter, even after the Holocaust with eyes fixed on pine orb, drops of crab oil, highway trail, automobiles to the stars, combustion, halibut, a Dolly Varton, electroshocker sampling on open fire pits, bridges, we bring tents. We bring the stench of tuberculosis, of plague, holding the eye, the ovoid eye of bear and moose and orca, something above our feet. We feel kindness, but we imagine disaster. We say whenever they are illuminated, how ships are named for queens, not nearly as black as mining for stones, argillite animals underneath not spoken, bottom strong, our arrival, we imagine disaster, happy for kindness, for waves, for marriage, for our children and our children's children, with new tongues, that taste of a balancing rock, FedExed packages and friends waving, plotting out our anchors, planning and planting fields and crops, from stern to bow, new files and new claims, a resting colony, 
a nap of migrating birds with our plastic pellets, beat, throat, lodge, the world wide web, also with our hands. And for those we hold dear, slipping, slipping, we imagine disaster, hoping for kindness. We imagine disaster and we hope for kindness. I'll end there, folks. Thank you very much. I see a whole bunch of questions in the chat. So thank you. This is my dog, Zoot, uh, who's three years old in a couple of days, half Great Pyrenees. I'm also happy to talk about the perils of uh, owning a guardian livestock dog for any of you who <laughs> also own guardian livestock dogs. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm super excited to uh, answer questions and have a conversation. And Jesse, please feel free. Uh, I don't know how these things are managed, but uh, feel free to open the, open the Zoom link so people can ask me questions. And would somebody else like to read me questions from chat or uh, is, that, um, is that something that I should do? Uh, yes, Sarah, we have a, a question from the audience. Uh, general question for Sarah, how do you reconcile really being a white woman who takes the stage on decolonization from what perspective are you offering from and who are you speaking to? Thank you. And I didn't catch who that question came from. Oh, Justine. Justine, thank you so much. Um, so I identify very much as a white person, preferably speaking to other white people who are interested in unsettling white supremacist power. I think that, um, as Kim Tolbear once wrote, that uh, white people need to start studying the fascinating questions of white people and should stop studying so many questions about uh, people who are actively through white supremacist violence uh, subjugated in contemporary colonial societies. Uh, Kim Talbert went on to add in that comment that uh, white people's work at studying white people should be deeply informed by, in the case of Kim Talbert's argument, Indigenous scholars, activists, and artists, and I would argue more broadly um, from voices and people representing the globe's majority populations. So, um, Stephanie, I think it's a it's a it's a fascinating question. Um, as a kind of um, old school feminist, I remember uh, when I was coordinating women's centers and rape relief shelters, um, men would phone me up and say, you know, it's disgusting that there's women only spaces and this needs to uh, change and men need to have men's only spaces and why are women working for women and I used to say to the people who called me up, I, please go ahead and uh, unsettle male violence. Um, I would be pleased if you did that, but don't expect me to do that for you. And I think, uh, broadly speaking, the same kind of logic applies to unsettling white supremacy. I think that uh, white people need to not um, pretend to be Indigenous people to unsettle white supremacist colonial violence. I think we need to speak to our own languages and try to unsettle the damages and the violences that we have wrought. And I think we need to be deeply informed by um, voices and activists and scholars and partners who are generously willing to work alongside us. Um, I, I will say that one of the things that I did with Lot was asked that only Black and Indigenous scholars, activists, um, and critics review it because I was very interested in not putting Lot into the public realm without it being vetted and spoken about by Black and Indigenous scholars, poets, and artists. Um, so the, the foreword to the book is actually written by Haida storyteller Kang Jade, uh, who I've known for many, many years. And I think in some ways the preface to the book by Kang Jade was um, 
was a really powerful framing of the book. Um, what Kang Jade spoke about is the violence that is coloniality and how it harms so many, um, but how it needs to be unsettled um, and how racism and anti-Indigenous racism is alive and well in every filament and moment of so-called Canadian uh, colonial Canada, um, and that it required that unsettling of colonial violence required um, in some ways people speaking together, but also people um, who were unearthing the the, the white supremacy of the language that um, that structures these lands. So, Justine, thank you um, so much, and I I appreciate the um, the genuine the genuineness of your question. Thank you, Sarah. We have another question from Annie. If you could summarize your presentation in one sentence, what would it be? Poetry can take down colonial violence. Less is more, thank you. And I believe we have another question. I will just acknowledge a comment by uh, my friend and uh, uh, yeah, long time comrade, Debbie Scarborough. Uh, I used to work with Debbie up in Terrace and Debbie took the photo of Zoot and I uh, just outside of Debbie and her wife's house in Penticton in Silks Territory. So Debbie, thanks for the photo of us. It was a great walk and I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Sorry, Jesse, to interrupt you. I think uh, uh, we have time for one more question uh, from Chess. Your poetry seems to address uh, the nuance of our complicated locations. How do you think we can use words to undercut systematic racism and colonial violence on a day-to-day -day level? That's to say, how can we unsettle our quotidian conversations? Jesse, thank you so much. Um, is that question in the, the chat? I'm just trying to look it up so that I can see it in, in, in yes. writing. Um, uh, who, yes. Who's it from, Jesse? From Chess. Sorry for my pronunciation. Oh, yes. no, your pronunciation is spectacular. Ah, from Chase. Okay. Poetry, thanks, Chase. Your poetry seems to address the nuance of our complicated locations. How do you think we can use words to undercut systematic racism and colonial violence on a day to day level? That is to say, how can we unsettle our quotidian conversations? Goodness, Chase. Um, by the nature of uh, the beauty and articulateness of your question, you may have answers that are better than mine, Chase. But um, I think first and foremost, recognizing that colonial violence is in such great part formed by words that we imagine and consequently can be unformed by imagining new words and new modes of communication. I mean, I, I look with such wonder and happiness, and here uh, I'll <laughs> gesture toward Debbie because, you know, we're both women who have to now wear bifocals, we're of such an age. Um, you know, there were times when mankind, when conversations about pronouns simply uh, were erased in the face of white masculinized heteronormativity. Those very like very foundational um, means of expressing ourselves, pronoun differences, pronoun flexibility, the fact that we don't accept things like mankind anymore, the fact that so many descriptors are out of date and are irreconcilable with contemporary politics, I think are indicators that once language shifts and everyday language shifts, Chase, so, so does um, our orientation to the world. I mean, this is a this is a fundamental sort of question about language being a world and languages forming worlds. So I think 
the way we speak, the way we use kindness as opposed to hostility, the way we shift the words that come out of our mouth, all of these possibilities in the everyday suggest new ways of reorienting to the world, I think, Chase. Um, and I mean, I think also at a very maybe almost juvenile uh, level, um, we can stop violent language. Um, certainly that's something that I try to do when I educate medical stu students. And we can ask that doctor-clinical, doctor-patient relationships are spoken about differently and that we use different languages in those interactions. And that's very much about um, reforming worlds in, in the everyday. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, thanks so much. And um, I don't know if there's any other questions or Jesse, uh, if, if there's anything else that you want to say or to close with. Thank you, Sarah. What a great discussion. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And thank you, Dr. Sarah, for your insights and to the audience, to great questions. Uh, now we will take, uh, oh, I think we have uh, one hour lunch break soon. Oh, lunch, always from, the best time of day. It's uh, from 12 to one o'clock. And the session is 45 minutes. We end up this session. What a treat, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jesse, everyone. thanks so much. And thanks again for opening with that poem that you found. That was just charming and it really um, set the tone perfectly. I, I look forward to our paths crossing one day soon, Jesse.